Open your Bibles. Wow. Does God have a serious message for you today? More serious than I intended it to be or expected it to be. So, don't blame me. Title of the message this morning, Beware a Seared Conscience. Whoa. Beware a seared conscience. We're in Mark. We're going verse by verse through Mark. We are doing verses 14 to 29 today. This is our third message in the trilogy from Mark on sharing the gospel. I mention often that Mark teaches in trilogies because, as every preacher knows, you have to say the same thing three times before people get it. And so Mark teaches with the same truth three times. This is the third one. Beware a seared conscience. Our conscience is that part of us that God put in us at creation that senses right from wrong. Romans 1 and Romans 2 both say that God has put in us the knowledge of right and wrong. That's our spiritual, moral conscience. And our conscience either comforts us or it afflicts us based on our choices and our actions. That's our conscience. Well, the Bible warns very sternly throughout the New Testament, especially, but really the old Bible, warns of a seared conscience. A seared conscience is a conscience that is no longer able to sense God's right and wrong. A conscience that's no longer sensitive to what God says is right and wrong. We call those absolutes today we're gonna see a graphic illustration of a seared conscience. Let's pray, we'll see it. Lord Jesus, would you show it to us, Lord? Lord, paint a picture of a seared conscience and put us in the middle of it, and Lord, we we'll give you the right to pierce our heart, to show us ourselves, our own conscience. And we pray that you would bring to mind people in our lives that are toying with a seared conscience that may be moving in that direction and cause our hearts to break for them and cry out to you on their behalf, Lord. Make this real to us, we pray. In your name, Jesus, amen. Don't you love John the Baptist? I mean, really, like if you got to say, you know, you got to look at some Bible characters, you got to love John the Baptist. John the Baptist was, is that not true? Am I the only one that likes this guy? This is Nuevo's kind of guy, man. Goat hair, honey and bees, you know, like a little bit maybe aggressive. <laughs> this guy belongs in uh, Juniper Flats. Uh, come on, you know he does. I love John the Baptist. He's a forerunner for Jesus. He was sent by God to turn the spiritual conscience of Israel back to God. That was his job in preparing the way for the Messiah. Luke 1.17 says this, when, Zech when the angel's talking to Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, he says, he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. That was John the Baptist's job. And he was certainly not afraid to share the truth of God's word with whoever needed it. You know these guys, right? I, you know, <laughs> I do. Regardless of their state in life, their status, regardless of their social or political or religious standing in culture, in the culture, John was very concerned with delivering the direct message of the gospel to anyone who was in front of him. The gospel message that he gave always started with the simple gospel that we shared last week. It's this, repent of your sins 
and turn to God for salvation. And he gave that message to everyone very directly, including the religious leaders, which he probably spoke to with more intensity than anyone else. Not too many other groups in society did he call a brood of vipers or warn them of God's impending judgment on them. This is why we love John the Baptist. Sometime after, this is why, I guess I'll say I, I love, so I love John the Baptist. Sometime after John baptized Jesus in the Jordan, he had the opportunity, John the Baptist did, had the opportunity to share the message of repentance with Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas, you want to know this guy. Herod Antipas was the ruler for Rome over the Galilee area in the north. So the northern end of Israel, that was his area. They called him King Herod, but really he was what they called a tetrarch, uh, like a governor, a baby king over the Galilee area. But Herod Antipas lived in a castle, a fortress that his father, Herod the Great, built that was near where John was baptizing in the Jordan River, where some of us will be baptized again in a month, right there where John was baptizing. So Herod Antipas, here's the problem. Herod Antipas is one of six Herods in the Bible. Okay, the Bible is full of Herods. The New Testament, full of Herods, and it can be a bit confusing, so here's what you need to know. You can't know it all today about all the Herods, but Herod Antipas was the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great, the most famous Herod, we call him the baby killer. Uh, he's typically known as Herod the baby killer, and that puts him in history when Christ was born because he's the one that had all the babies killed in Bethlehem. He's also the one that built, in essence, the temple, the magnificent Temple Mount and the temple uh, during the time of Jesus, prior to Jesus. It was actually a remodel, but such a massive remodel seemed like new uh, phenomenal development. That was Herod the Great. This Herod that we're meeting today, Herod Antipas, was his son, ruler for Rome, in the Galilee. You got him? All right, so we're going to meet the players, just the two critical players in our story today, two out of three. First one, Herod Antipas, who we've already met, son of Herod the Great, Rome's ruler over Galilee. Got him. Next, you got to know his wife, because she's a winner. <laughs> she goes by either Herodias or Salome. Uh, which is a small town in Arizona also, uh, probably no connection. But I do have family there. Blythe got too big for them, so they moved to Salome, really a little bitty town over there. Uh, so Herod's wife, Herodias, you need to know her. Here's what you need to know about Herodias. I'm setting the stage culturally so that you understand the, the environment culturally that this text, that this lesson occurs in. Herodias was the daughter of Herod Antipas's half brother. All right. So a daughter of his brother makes her his niece. All right. So Herodias was Herod Antipas's niece. Then she married another half brother of Herod Antipas. And so she became his niece and his sister in law. And then he married her. So now she's his niece, his sister-in-law, and his wife, okay? That's how you get a family tree with no branches. It's just like a trunk goes straight up and down, okay? I know some people with family trees like that. This is Herod. This is who Herod is. This is his wife. Here's the deal. John the Baptist let Herod know that this was not right in God's eyes. John the Baptist let Herod know that this was against God's law. And so Herodias, being the niece, sister-in-law, wife of Herod, committed to remove John's influence permanently from her life. 
she was going to remove John at whatever cost. She actually made a vow. She held a grudge, made a vow to remove his influence, much like our culture today can, can I, I just need to say it, and if you don't believe me, you know, open your eyes, uh, you know, <laughs> lovingly. Our culture today is trying very hard to permanently remove the influence of God's law on the culture. The entire media is set on it. They've taken a vow to remove everything that's right or wrong in God's eyes from anything that influences us. So we are not far from the picture that our text paints today. The third player is Herodias' daughter, and suffice it to say, we'll meet her when she comes on the scene. You with me so far? All right, that's the cultural setting. Mark first mentioned the arrest of John the Baptist back in Mark chapter one, but it was just like a little casual mention, and now in chapter six, Mark returns to it in Quentin Tarantino fashion, all right? Now, I can't handle Quentin Tarantino movies, okay? And I'm not sure I should, but uh, I can't handle the flashback, you know, the kind of the flashback storytelling uh, and Mark does that here. He tells this story in flashback mode, so we're not going to do that because my mind's not that sharp, so I'm going to switch it around and we're going to try to tell it chronologically, okay? Okay, that means we start in verse 17, not verse 14. Mark 6, verse 17. You ready to dive in? Here we go. For Herod had sent soldiers to arrest and imprison John as a favor to Herodias, his wife. She had been his brother Philip's wife, but Herod had married her. That's what I just told you. Verse 18, John had been telling Herod, it is against God's law for you to marry your brother's wife, not to mention your niece. So here's a question for you to kind of help you put yourself in this picture. How does it go for you when you say to someone, you know what you're doing is actually against what God says you should be doing? You know what you're doing is actually against God's law. How does it go? Is it just me that people respond poorly to? When I say that, or when you say to someone, you know, that thing you're doing is not right in God's eyes based on God's word. And how do you think it's going for us as a church to say to our culture, that thing that you're making okay, God says is not okay? How is it going? <laughs> you know, it used to be. In our culture, it used to be when you tell somebody, when, or, or I mean, it wasn't even the media, you know, wasn't even doing the reconstruction thing they're doing now, but you used to be able to tell someone, you know what you're doing is actually a sin, and they would say, yeah, I know, I know. Not anymore, right? Now, they want to do to us what Herodias, Herod's wife, did to John the Baptist. They want to remove us. And, and if you have someone in your life that you say, you know, that thing you're doing is not right before God, their first thought is, how can I kill this person, right? Like, I want to remove this person's influence from my life. This is what's happening. It's not that far from what we see today. And I think, to me, it seems clear that soon, soon, that we will face imprisonment in our culture for saying that something is against God's law or is not right in God's eyes. The same words that John the Baptist is saying to Herod. So the worst is the worst is coming to John the Baptist and to us, I believe. Uh, read with me Mark 6, verse 19. Here is the getting worse for John. Mark 6, 19, so Herodias bore a grudge. It's it can be loosely translated, she made a vow, she made a commitment against John and wanted to kill him. 
She wants to permanently remove his influence over her life. But without Herod's approval, she was powerless. So John the Baptist had the protection of the king, of King Herod Antipas. Why? Why was the king protecting John the Baptist? This is the core of the message. The message only has two parts. This is the part you have to get, all right? And then I'll make sure you get the second part if, if possible. Uh, God help me. Here's the question. Why is Herod protecting John the Baptist? Like verse 19 says, the answer, as always, is in the next verse. Look closely at Mark 6, verse 20. For Herod respected John. It's really important. Herod respected John. And knowing that he was a good and holy man, he protected him. Have you ever known this person? That you're sharing with them that what they're doing is actually against God's law or is not right in God's eyes? And, and, they don't try to kill you, okay? That's unique in and of itself. Uh, I don't mean physically, all right? But, you know, they, they what do they call it on Facebook? They defriend you. <laughs> Unfriend you, whatever it is. Block you. They, they try to remove your influence. But Herod respected John, and he knew he was a good and holy man, and he protected him. Though he wasn't repenting, though he wasn't really receiving, as far as his actions go, what John said, look at the last sentence in verse 20. I love this especially. Herod was greatly disturbed whenever he talked with John. Even so, he liked to listen to him. Now, this is a man with an internal struggle. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but it's a little bit like someone who you know disagrees with you, but they still ask to have the debate. They still, they still kind of, you know, goad you into an argument. It's, it's like they're not, they're not accepting what you're saying about Christ or about God's law or God's ways, but they want to talk about it. Even though they get worked up about it, even though they haven't received it, there is something going on here. And here's what it is. This is a huge, huge verse to understand the lesson today because it shows this. It shows that Herod still had a conscience that was sensitive to the things of God. That's what this verse shows. And it's gonna matter when we get to the end, so remember it. Herod still had a conscience that was sensitive to the things of God. He knew what he was doing was wrong. He respected the man of God and the things of God. And even though he was disturbed, he wanted to listen to them. Don't you know, <laughs> that's my Canadian impression. Don't you know, don't... <laughs> Don't you know, don't you know that when, when somebody is there, they, they might even be against you or they might be debating or they might be challenging you, but they want to talk about it. There's something going on inside of them that's drawing them to the things of God. There's some light, there's something in there that makes them want to hear more about God. And you know John the Baptist started his message with Herod Repent of your sins. That's how he started all of his messages. Repent of your sins and turn to God for salvation. And as he talked and as Herod called him, now out of jail, as Herod called to talk with him, you know that the subject of his marriage came up. We just read that it did. And John would point out that Herod's marriage was not right in the eyes of God. Yet verse 20 says Herod respected John. So, so I need you to see that there's an ember burning in Herod. There's a conscience in Herod that is still sensitive to the things of God and even to some extent drawn to the things of God. And, and listen, by the way, having a disturbed conscience is a really good sign. Having a disturbed conscience is a really good sign because it means that you're still sensitive to what's right and wrong in God's eyes. 
It's when you're no longer disturbed about living against God or his, his law that you need to be concerned. And so Herod had a disturbed conscience, a good sign. Maybe, maybe he just appreciated the fact that John had the courage to tell him the truth. Right? There's a few people like that. Like, you know, I don't agree with you, but I appreciate your courage to tell me because I could kill you right here. I mean, that's what Herod would have said. Maybe there was something in Herod that caused him to recognize God's truth. Like, okay, I'm not ready to change my life, but I recognize this is God. Maybe he was drawn to John the Baptist because he actually was drawn at some level to the things of God. He had something in him that was hopeful that God could grow into a transformed life. That's the point of the message, that at this time in Herod's life, his conscience was still sensitive to God. It was being impacted by the things of God and drawn to God. There's actually a good chance, this is encouragement for all parents and grandparents, there's a very good chance that that ember of light, that little bit of of sensitivity to the things of God was actually put in Herod Antipas's heart by his father and his mother. Because we know that Herod the Great, this Herod's father, though he was not a Jew, he was an Edomite, his wife was a Jew, and he, is, he was raised, his mother, I mean, I'm sorry, his mother was a Jew, and he was raised in a Jewish house. And so they called him like a half Jew, not, well, it's kind of hard to explain, but even as an Edomite, he's a part Israelite, but anyway, he, he Herod the Great was influenced by the law of God which is partly for sure why he rebuilt the temple. That was Herod Antipas's father. Good chance that Herod Antipas grew up in a home where the things of God were inserted into his life. And so now John comes speaking the things of God and it stirs up something that's in Herod. It might just be a little light in the corner of his heart, but there was some desire at the very least to know God. Are you getting a picture of Herod right now? It's really, really important. God was stirring the smallest spark of possible faith in Herod. Here's a question. Will it grow or will it be put out permanently? That's what we see as we continue. The black widow comes on the scene in verse 21, and John the Baptist ends his earthly life, or has it ended for him. Mark 6, verse 21, Herodias's chance, that's Herod's wife, Herodias's chance finally came on Herod's birthday. He gave a party for his high government officials, army officers, and the leading citizens of Galilee. Then his daughter also named Herodias, or Salome, came in and performed a dance that greatly pleased Herod and his guests. All right, again, back to painting the picture of the cultural dysfunction that Rome was in, uh, sensual, sexual dysfunction above all other dysfunctions. These parties were common, very common for rulers. It was a time for them to show off with their buddies, not unlike some, you know, guy things today, uh, but most like a non-Christian bachelor party or what they used to call stag parties. Uh, that's what this party looked like. These government officials, army officers, leading citizens, almost all, if not all, were men. And the scene that you have here is one of excess in all things fleshly. It was excess food, it was excess alcohol, and it was excess sensual entertainment. These parties centered around food and alcohol and sexual entertainment. That's what it was. Don't be like all, oh, because that's our entire culture I just described. Okay, that's what it looks like. So the more sensual the entertainment, the better the party for all these drunk old men. Right? You with me? All right, here's where it gets downright creepy. 
Verse 22 says, Herod's daughter comes in and performs a dance. Okay, this isn't an interpretive dance that you would see on the stage of a hip church, okay? And not that kind of dance. <laughs> you know, this is for, for that time and, and probably as much as we would say today, some type of a sensual, you know, I, I mean, I probably don't have to describe it anymore. It's a sensual dance. Now, to try to make it just slightly less creepy, this was actually his stepdaughter, though I don't know that that really helps. Uh, but this was Herod's stepdaughter um, performing this enticing sensual dance, assuming she was young, teenage years. All right, this is debauchery. All right, this is, this is worldly, sensual-oriented partying. Uh, it's certain that her mom had put her up to it because her mom was trying to use her. This is even worse. Her mom was trying to use her in order to set Herod up for what she wanted. You with me? You got the scene? All right. So the daughter's dance greatly pleases all the guests. And then we continue in verse 22b, second half, into verse 23. King Herod says, ask me for anything you like. The king said to the girl, and I will give it to you. He even vowed, I will give you whatever you ask up to half my kingdom. Arr! You know, this is, a, this is the manly, like King Kong, you know, I'm king of the hill, I'm the man, I'm the king. He, he puts on this huge display and, and it's, she wasn't the only, I guarantee, she wasn't the only um, sensual type entertainment, the alcohol's flow on the best of everything. And, and this right here is a statement of massive pride. So he is, he's showing off to the boys, right? You understand where he's at. And, and listen, here's the deal, okay? He suddenly finds himself, without any design of his own, he finds himself at the crossroads of his life, right here. This is the defining moment of Herod's spiritual life. Just like Robert Johnson, that old blues artist, if you don't know him, you ought to, who is um, maybe credited with the development of the blues. So the story goes, he went down to the crossroads and he met the devil there that night. And he traded his soul for the supernatural ability to play the guitar. And plenty of people believe the fable by how he could play. Herod's at the crossroads. And he's about to sell his soul. He is about to at least sell out his soul. He is about to make a decision that will sear his conscience so he never has to deal with it again. The daughter knew she was being used by her mother to get something from Herod, and so we read in Mark 6, verses 24 and 25, she went out and asked her mother, what should I ask for? Her mother told her, ask for the head of John the Baptist. So the girl hurried back to the king and told him, I want the head of John the Baptist right now on a tray. After all, it was a feast. So give me the head of the man of God on a silver tray. There is a famous play, uh, primarily kind of Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, a uh, very famous play based on this text where the girl who played Herodias' daughter, when the head of John the Baptist came back on the tray, she kisses it. This is, if you think this is much worse than the culture we live in today, don't be so quick to judge. This is radical debauchery. And at that moment, when she asked for the head of John the Baptist, something broke in Herod the king. Something snapped. Because he had to choose in that instant 
to either hold on to what little light he had left of God, to hold on to what little sensitivity he had left in his conscience towards God, or to sear his conscience in order to make this decision. He had to choose either the world or what little he still had about God. He had to choose to sear his conscience in order to make this decision. I need you to understand what little light Herod had about God was about to be snuffed out. Mark 6, verse 26. Then the king deeply regretted what he had said, but because of the vows he had made in front of his guests, he couldn't refuse her. No, he could have. If he would have chose what little conscience he had left about God, if he would have chose what little bit he still knew right from wrong from God, he could have, but he didn't. He chose the world. He chose the sensual immorality of the world. He chose his drinking buddies, his partying buddies, and he most of all, he chose his pride, his King Kong, I'm the man, pride, and he wasn't going to back down for those things, and so he chose what he knew would sear his conscience towards God, and that's what happened. From this moment, you're going to see it as it plays out, from this moment, Herod's conscience is seared beyond recovery. There had been this beginning of a spiritual awakening in his life. There was an ember of light in his very, very dark world. But when it came down to choosing either the sin and the ways of the world or choosing what little light he had left of God, he chose the world, and it snuffs out the light of God for the rest of his life. We're going to see it. Mark 6, verse 27. So he, Herod, immediately sent an executioner to the prison to cut off John's head and bring it to him. The soldier beheaded John in the prison, brought his head on a tray, and gave it to the girl who took it to her mother. When John's disciples heard what had happened, they came to get his body and buried it in a tomb. Now let me tell you what I think is the most important part of this lesson. Right now, with the head of John the Baptist on a platter, right at this moment, God would have forgiven Herod. After the fact, after he had John the Baptist beheaded and delivered on a platter, he could have chosen to repent and ask for forgiveness. And had he chosen to repent and ask for forgiveness, God would have faithfully forgiven him with the blood still dripping off the platter. Do we believe that? Don't we have the problem of, oh no, I've done too much, I've gone too far, God can never forgive me. That's not true. Let me give you an example that's legit, okay? You killed Jesus. All Herod did was kill John the Baptist. You and I killed Jesus. Our sins put Jesus on the cross. The Son of God had to die because of choices you and I have made. And God will forgive us instantly when we ask him. And we killed his own son. And the moment we ask God to forgive us, he does. I need you to know that grace is still there for Herod. He could have been forgiven in a moment had he been able to ask. Had he been able to bring himself to ask for forgiveness, God would have given it instantaneously instantaneously and completely. God would have given it. But a seared conscience prevents us from asking. That's the fear of a seared conscience. 
But God's not done giving him choices. Look back up now, starting at verse 14, chronologically. This is a year, year and a half later. Some say maybe even two years, but it's sometime later. Mark 6, verse 14. Herod's been going on about his life, forgetting that he ever did this. And now, verse 14, Herod Antipas, the king, soon heard about Jesus because everyone was talking about him. Some were saying, this must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. That's why he can do such miracles. Others said he's the prophet Elijah. Still others said he's a prophet like the other great prophets of the past. Verse 16, when Herod heard about Jesus, he said, John, the man I beheaded has come back from the dead. Now, do you really think that Herod thought this was actually John the Baptist personally, that had come back from the dead? Or is it possible he's speaking metaphorically, symbolically, like, I thought I was done dealing with that with God. I put that away. I've been covering that up with alcohol and sexual entertainment and my buddies and partying and the things of the world. I thought I'd killed that and it was gone. And now God brings it right back into my face. That's what's happening. <laughs> Listen, has that ever happened to you? Where you, there, there was some light, there was some, some draw to God, and because of whatever the motivation was, you killed that in your life, you removed it in your life, and you go on about your merry way, just living happily in sin, or, or so you think, and, uh, and then one day something happened and God brings it right back into your face. And he lays it out on the table and he says, this is still here, what are you gonna do about it? And it's God offering us his grace. You have to understand the grace of God never gives up on us. And God will continue to bring that back and say, you need my forgiveness. You need to receive my grace. You need to receive salvation in me. And so I'm going to push this back in front of you to make you deal with it again, to keep your conscience sensitive to what God wants to do in your life, which is forgive you and love you and give you his grace. But Herod's conscience was so seared that he was unable to sense the work or even the presence of God. It's not because God stopped trying. It's because his conscience was so seared he was unable to see God at work in his life. Luke 23 is where it happens to Herod. You can turn back there if you want. I'm just gonna read one verse and gotta tell you the story for time's sake. In Luke chapter 23, Jesus is on trial before Pilate, right? Just hours before he goes to the cross. He's on trial with Pilate, and in verse six of Luke 23, Pilate finds out that Jesus is a Galilean, and he knows that Herod, this same Herod, Herod Antipas, is in town, probably for the Passover, not that you know, he really followed the Jewish laws, but it's a big party. Uh, he lives there, you know, in what we call Jordan now, across, you know, not far from Jerusalem. So, so Herod Antipas is in Jerusalem. Pilate knows about it. And so in verse six, Pilate sends Jesus to Herod. Do you remember the story in the trials? Jesus goes, it's the same Herod. It's not a different Herod. Same guy. The same Herod that was moved by John's words, the same Herod that respected the man of God, the same Herod that was disturbed by hearing the truth of God, the same Herod that had a light in him, that had a spark, an ember in him towards the things of God, a conscience that was still sensitive to the things of God. And Herod wants to see Jesus, but not for the same reasons he wanted to see John the Baptist, for very different reasons. And so Jesus is taken to Herod. Now, Herod has the very Son of God standing in front of him, the author and giver of life and light. God in the flesh is standing in front of him, and all Herod could do, listen please, all Herod could do was mock him. 
There was a time when there was something in Herod's conscience and in his heart that drew him to the things of God. Now God himself is standing in front of him and all Herod can do is mock him. Why? Because his conscience is so seared that he can't even sense that the almighty God, the radiance of God is standing in front of him. Why do you think Jesus went to Herod? I mean, Jesus is in control of the whole thing. Don't think he's not. At one time, Herod was interested, sensitive to the things of God. Now he can't see a glimpse. And all he does is taunt Jesus. If you've seen movies about this, you see it well well done, where Herod's taunting Jesus to perform some miracle and asking him ridiculous questions. And finally, Luke 23, verse 11, if you're there, look at verse 11. Luke 23, 11 on the wall, it says, then Herod and his soldiers, soldiers began mocking and ridiculing Jesus. Finally, they put a royal robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. Guys, this is terrifying. It's terrifying. John the Baptist had given Herod a little bit of light. Maybe his parents did or grandparents did before. God had planted that glimmer of light in him. And at the crossroads of his life, his conscience was seared. Primarily through one decision. And it began a full-scale slide into the darkness of sin in the world that he could never recover from. Not that God wouldn't allow him to. Jesus showed up personally to give him a chance to recover. But his conscience was dead. And Jesus doesn't even speak. He doesn't speak because he knows Herod can't hear because his conscience is seared, it's too late. Our Kent Hughes says here in his commentary, it's on the wall, Herod sees nothing in Christ, and more terrifying, Christ sees nothing in him. Herod's conscience is seared, and the darkness wins his soul. So let me say to close, if you are not a believer yet, if you sense something about God in you, if, if you're drawn to the rights and wrongs of God, if, you, if you're drawn to the things of God, be careful, man, be careful. Keep your heart and your conscience open to be sensitive to God. Don't shut this off. Because the Bible over and over warns and gives illustration of those whose consciences ultimately become seared and unable to be sensitive to God. Be careful. Beware. Keep a hold on whatever amount of truth you have of God. Don't let the darkness of sin, the guilt of past sin, of decisions, don't let them overwhelm you and sear your conscience. Stay sensitive to God because God will keep chasing you and he'll keep offering you forgiveness and reconciliation and grace, but there comes a time when you won't be able to hear it. Act on what you've received. Move closer to whatever level of truth you have about God. Move closer to it. Don't try to shut it out of your life. Don't try to forget it or cover it up or or remove it with the things of this world. Whatever amount of truth you have of God, embrace it. And more than anything else, beware. Be very afraid of a seared conscience. Let's pray. Lord, I can't get It can't get any more direct than that, Lord. Lord, save us. Save us from our own self-deception. 
save us, God, from removing you from our lives and replacing you with the things of this world, the pleasures of this world, or our own pride, or anything else, God. Lord, keep us sensitive to you, to the things of God. Keep us sensitive to what's right and wrong. Give us a conscience, Lord, that's growing in the grace and knowledge of you, not declining. Draw us more and more to yourself, Lord. Reveal more and more of yourself to us. If you're here today and if you think I'm talking to you, I'm not, but the Holy Spirit is. Would you just pray right now? Would you just pray the best prayer in the Bible? Lord, save me. Save me, Lord. Give me a conscience that's sensitive to you, a heart that's sensitive to you. Put in me a desire, Lord, to know you more, to know the things of God more. Save me from my own deceitful heart, from the delusions of my sin in the world. And save me, Lord, from slipping away from you. For your glory in my life, Lord. In your name, Jesus.